Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be looking at AQA, A-level chemistry, organic chemistry part one. So this is for the AS content um, and I'll be getting the A2 content up soon. But today is basically just an introduction to organic chemistry, alkanes, ha halogenoalkanes, alkenes, alcohols and organic analysis. Before we jump in, um, feel free to subscribe so you can get notified about other uh, A-level chemistry videos that I upload and I ha also have psychology and sociology up on my channel as well so if you also study those subjects then feel free to go check them videos out as well but I shall just jump straight in now oh, also feel free to like the video and comment below if you have any questions at all and I'll try, get, try and get back to them as soon as possible or if not I'm sure one of your fellow students will help you out so starting off with the introduction to organic chemistry. So firstly, we have a lot of formula terms we need to learn. So starting off with empirical formula. So this is the simplest whole number ratio of atoms of each element in a compound. Then we have molecular formula. So the true number of atoms of each atom of each element in a compound. General formula. Um, so all members of a homolo homologous organic series follow a general formula. So an example of this is alkanes which follows the general formula of Cn, H, 2n plus 2. Structural formula, so this shows the structural arrangement of atoms within, within a molecule. So you kind of see here in the little example what it means and how this kind of differs to the others coming up. So you then have displayed formula, which shows every atom and every bond in an organic compound. Then skeletal formula, so it shows only the bonds in a compound and any non-carbon atoms. So for this, it assumes that Every, th every carbon atom has two to three, depending on where, it's, where it is in the molecule, um, hydrogen atoms, unless stated otherwise. So organi organic compounds are often part of a hom homologous series in which all members follow a general formula and react in a similar way. Each consecutive member differs by CH2 and there is an increase in boiling points as chain length increases. So reaction mechanisms show the movement of electrons within a reaction shown by curved arrows. So you'll see a lot of these um, reaction mechanisms from now on. And you can see the little example there of um, H2O being formed and a chlorine ion. Uh, and these mechanisms are used to show the reactions of organic compounds. Then we have isomerism. So this is a big, big topic for this kind of, especially going into this side of chemistry. So isomers are molecules with the same molecular formula, but a different arrangement of atoms within the molecule. So we've got some different types of isomers. So you've got structural. So these have a different structural arrangement of atoms. They can be straight or branch chains, but will have the same molecular formula. Then you have position is isomers. So these have the functional group of the molecule. These have the same functional group um, of, the of the molecule, but in a different position on the carbon chain. So as you can see in the little example, the um, alcohol has changed from the first to the second carbon. Then you have a functional group isomers. So these have a different arrangement of the molecular formula. So that the molecule has a different functional group. And then you've got stereoisomers. So these have a different spatial arrangement, a type of stereoisomerism, uh, <laughs> apologies, is EZ isomerism where limited rotation around a double carbon bond means that groups can either be together or apart. The E isomer has these groups apart and the Z isomer has these groups together. So we then have the Kahn in gold prelog CIP priority rules. So this is specifically for the stereoisomer. So the, there is a priority of different groups and molecules that can display EZ isomerism. So the atomal group on each side of the double bond with the higher AR slash MR is given the higher priority. So in this little example, you can see at the bottom, I'm not sure how clear that'll be for you to read, but um, so in this example, the, the carbon double bond is bonded to bromine, fluorine, hydrogen, and chlorine. So bromine has a higher atomic number than fluorine. So then bromine is the high priority. And then also chlorine has a high atomic number than hydrogen. So um, chlorine has a high priority. And so that makes this example a Z isomer. Now moving to look specifically at alkanes. So alkanes go through a process known as fractional distillation. So an example, so crude oil, 
is a mixture of different hydrocarbons and could be separated by this process as the different chain lengths have different boiling points. Crude oil is separated, so the mixture is vaporised and fed into the fractionating column. The vapours rise, cool and condense, and then the products are siphoned off for different uses. Obviously, um, so because some products have short carbon ch chains, they have a lower boiling point, meaning they rise higher up the column before reaching their boiling point and are so are collected at the top of the column. And products with lower carbon chain, long carbon chains have higher boiling points, so they don't rise as far before reaching boiling point and so condense and collect at the bottom of the fractionating column. So that's how they end up being separated. The compounds collected are then broken down further via cracking because long carbon chains aren't always the most useful. Um, a lot of our fuels and things are based off um, short carbon chains. So cracking, so long car longer carbon chains are very useful. So broken down to form smaller, more useful molecules by breaking carbon bonds requiring harsh reaction conditions. And there are two types of cracking. So thermal cracking produces a high proportion of alkanes and alkenes at a temperature of 1200 Kelvin and 7000 kilopascals. So that's the pressure. And then we have catalytic cracking, which produces aromatic compounds with carbon rings at around 720 Kelvin, with normal pressure and a zeolite catalyst. Alkanes make good fuels as they release a lot of energy when burned and with sufficient energy, they undergo complete combustion to produce carbon dioxide and water. If there is insufficient oxygen, combustion is incomplete and carbon monoxide and water are produced. Carbon monoxide is a toxic gaseous product and has no colour or odour and oxides of nitrogen are also produced as a byproduct of alkane combustion but these are removed from a system using a catalytic converter, so an example is the rhodium catalyst which converts harmful products into more st stable products such as carbon dioxide and water. Further, incomplete combustion also produces carbon particulates, small fragments of unburned hydrocarbons, and unless removed, these can cause serious respiratory problems as they pollute the air. Sulfur impurities can lead to the acidification of water in the Earth's atmosphere as they react to form a weak form of um, H2SO4. But the impurities can be removed via flue gas desulfurization, which uses calcium oxide and gypsum. Unless treated or removed, these pollutants can contribute to global warming, acid rain, and health issues in humans. Then we have the chlorination of alkanes. So alkanes react with halogens in the presence of UV light to produce halogenoalkanes. The UV light breaks down the halogen bonds, producing reactive intermediates called free radicals, which attack the alkanes in a series of reactions, initiation, propagation, and termination. The propagation step can continue many times to result in multiple substitutions. This is a chain reaction. Condition of the reaction can be altered to favour the termination step and limit the number of substitutions. So here in the middle you can kind of see these steps. So step one, initiation, the halogen is breaking down. And just to clarify, the little dot that's next to the CL on the right hand side is the way we represent free radicals or like free electrons. So that's something that you'll start to see kind of regularly and need to be aware of. Um, then step two is propagation. So a hydrogen is replaced and the Cl radical reformed as a catalyst. And then finally termination. So two radicals join to end the chain reaction and form a stable product. Now looking closer at halogenoalkanes. So these can go through nucleophilic substitution. So Halogenoalkanes contain polar bonds as the halogens are more electronegative than carbon atoms, which means electron density is drawn towards the halogen, forming um, positive and negative regions. Nucleophiles are positive liking and contain a lone electron pair that is attracted to positive regions of molecules. So an example of CN um, minus, so you can see where the um, electron pairs are. They must be shown with the line with the lone electron pair and often a negative sign indicating they are nucleophiles. The reaction mechanism shows how nucleophiles attack halogenoalkanes to produce alcohol slash amines. So at the bottom here, there's two on this side of the on the slide. So the left hand side is you can see the process of, of it producing alcohols, and then on the right hand side you can see it producing amines. The greater the MR of the halogen in the polar bond, the lower the bond enthalpy, meaning it could be broken more easily 
Therefore, the rate of reaction for these halogenoalkanes is faster, and nucleophilic substitution reactions can only occur for one degree or and two degree halogenoalkanes, which we'll discuss a little bit more about what that exactly means um, later on in the presentation. But then moving forward onto elimination, so when a halogenoalkane is heated to high temperatures under alkaloid conditions, elimination occurs. In this reaction, the nucleophile acts as a base and accepts a proton, removing a hydrogen atom from the molecule. This results in the elimination of the halide 2, producing a double carbon bond, of, aka known as an alkene. Elimination occurs with second and third degree halogenoalkanes. Ozone in the atmosphere absorbs UV radiation, so CFCs, which are chlorofluorocarbons, um, absorb UV radiation, breaking down the carbon-halogen bonds to form free radicals that can catalyse ozone depletion. CFC-free solvents are now being produced to prevent them entering the atmosphere to minimise ozone depletion and global warming. So you can see down at the bottom, the, there is the reaction for elimination. So how you can see this bond and the electrons moving to form that double carbon bond. And then you also have the reaction process for you involving CFCs. Now looking at alkenes. So these are unsaturated hydrocarbons, meaning they contain a double carbon bond, which is an area of high electron density making it susceptible, susceptible to attack from electrophiles. And it consists of a pi bond. I can't entirely remember what that um, symbol's called. Um, bromine water is used to identify this double bond and other unsaturated compounds, changing from orange-brown to colourless if the double bond is present. Alkenes undergo electrophilic addition about the double bond. Electrophiles are electron acceptors and are attracted to areas of high electron density. For example, uh, Br2, I believe that's, apologies for that. I believe that is meant to not say her. I think that's meant to be high H2O or yeah, or just H2. Um, <laughs> apologies for that. Um, and can be used to form alcohols or halogenoalkanes from alkenes. The reaction mechanism shows how electrophiles attack the double bond to form a carbocation or carb carbocation, which is a carbon atom with only three bonds, so it has a positive charge. Carbocations can have varying st stability, with tertiary being the most stable and primary the least. The more stable, the more likely it is to form. Therefore, in an addition reaction, multiple products can form, but the major product is the most stable possible. And you can see here some examples on the right hand side of how these reactions work. Now looking at addition polymers, so these are produced from alkenes when the double bond is broken to form a repeating unit. The repeating unit must always be shown with extended bonds through the brackets. Okay, so when you're, if you're asked to draw a polymer, you need to make sure that, that line goes outside the brackets. The reaction conditions used in the production of these polymer chains can be altered to give the plastics produced different properties. High temperatures and pressures produced um, branch chain polymers with weak intermolecular forces, whereas lower pressures and temperatures produce straight chain polymers with strong intermolecular forces. Polymers are unreactive hydrocarbon chains with multiple strong non-polar covalent bonds, which makes them useful for man manufacturing many everyday plastic products such as shopping bags. However, the unreactive nature of the bonds in addition polymers means they are not biodegradable and cannot be broken down by species in nature. PVC is an addition polymer with waterproof properties due to the addition of plasticizers during the reaction. Now, moving forward onto alcohol. So alcohols contain an OH group and follow the general formula of Cn2, uh, H2N plus 1 OH and can produ be produced by two main methods. So first is hydration, so produced from alkenes in the presence of an acid catalyst, e.g. phosphoric acid under aqueous conditions at 300 degrees Celsius and high pressures. This has a very high percentage yield as ethanol is the only product so is favoured in industrial processes. Then we have fermentation, so enzymes break down starch from crops into sugars, which can then be fermented to form alcohol, which is cheaper than hydration as it can be carried out at a lower temperature, but it has to be fermented in batches, so it is a slower process with a lower percentage yield. Ethanol is a common biofuel produced in this way. Um, it is said to be carbon neutral as the carbon given out 
when it is burned is equal to the carbon taken in by the crops during the growing process. Now here's where we look at what is primary, secondary and tertiary. Um, so the primary and secondary degree alcohols can be oxidised to form various products and you can kind of see at the top exactly what we mean by primary, secondary and tertiary. Um, I won't explain it, it's quite obvious to see where the difference is. Um, but primary, primary alcohols can be heated in the presence of acidified potassium dichromate and distilled to produce aldehydes. When heated further under reflux conditions, primary alcohols can be oxidised further to produce carboxylic acids. Secondary alcohols can be oxidised when heated in the presence of acidified potassium dichromate to produce ketones. And potassium dichromate is used in the oxidation of alcohols as the oxidising agent. It is reduced as the alcohol is oxidised, which can then be observed as a colour change from orange to, orange to green when the alcohol is oxidised. Again, this is very difficult for tertiary alcohols to be oxidised, so this is unlikely to happen, so there won't be a colour change for that one. Now looking at organic analysis, so this is the final slide for today. So there's a few tests here that you need to know. So for testing, if you're testing for alcohols, so this is going to be primary and secondary alcohols using acidified potassium dichromate and the colour will change from orange to green like we've just discussed. Then there's two different tests you can do for aldehydes. So you can use Tollens reagent, which will add and warm gently, which will change from colourless to providing kind of a mirror sheen. Or you've got felling solution. Apologies, that's a spelling that's autocorrect, doing me dirty. <laughs> um, and again, you're going to add and warm gently. This will change from blue to brick red if the aldehyde is present. Then the test for alkenes, uh, adding bromine water, which will go from orange brown to colourless. And then finally, carboxylic acid. So you're going to add sodium carbonate, bubble CO2 through lime water, and it will turn cloudy. Then a type of organic analysis, so mass spectrometry, is an analytical technique to identify compounds and determine their molecular formula. But there is also high resolution mass spectrometry, which is much more sensitive and determines MR to several decimal places, giving precise atomic masses. Infrared spectroscopy is an analytical technique that uses infrared radiation to determine the functional groups presenting organic compounds. By passing the infrared radiation through a sample where the different bonds absorb the radiation in different amounts, which is then recorded and shown on a spectrum which has characteristic curves for the different functional groups. Each spectrum has a fingerprint region to the right hand side which contains tiny differences from species to species, which acts as a molecule's fingerprint allowing it to be identified. Infrared absorption also occurs in the atmosphere with molecules such as ozone, which causes heat to be trapped within the Earth's atmosphere. However, when chemicals such as CFCs are released into the atmosphere from human activity, this heating is enhanced due to leading to global warming. So you can kind of see an example at the top of what an infrared spectroscopy can look like. And then you've also got these key um, measures down at the bottom. So these are generally where you'll see a peak for certain common um, functional groups, such as an alcohol um, or an acid, double carbon bond or the carbonyl bond. So you can kind of see where these general regions will pop up. And I'm not entirely sure if you need to memorise these for the exam, but it, it doesn't cause any harm if you kind of know them well. But that is everything for today's presentation. Organic Chemistry Part 2 will be incoming. So that will be the actual main A2, A-level content. This was just AS. But again, like I said at the beginning, feel free to subscribe and comment below any questions you have. And I will get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks.